or something. There we go. Oh shit, we're live. We're on. Yes. For mm -hmm. thirty four hundred <laughs> people. That's not true. Hi everyone. We're supposed to ramble for a minute to slow roll this introduction to let people join us. A little bit of small talk. Work the audience. Work the room. Did you catch the game last night? Which game? I didn't catch either one. <laughs> uh, Football? Yes. Sorry for anyone in Atlanta, but the Falcons did get crushed. <sighs> that's rough. Again. <laughs> the Falconers. Mm -hmm. All right. That's one minute in. We're going to go 30 more seconds, and then we're going to start. All right. We did sports. How's the weather out there today, Isaac? Beautiful. Sunny. Crisp. I need to yank my garden out. Let's talk. Let's stop wasting people's time. Hi, everyone. I think you can see us. Uh, my name is Isaac. Hi, I'm Cody. This is Cody. We're co-founders of Codo Design. Uh, we're here today to discuss how to rebrand your brewery. So from 2010 to 2017, uh, we worked predominantly with breweries and planning. Think about the craft beer boom and where we were at that time. 1,500-ish breweries in 2010 to... What, 83? So uh, at the start of 2020, so we were traveling all over the country, helping to bring new breweries to market. In 2017, seemingly overnight, we saw the shift in our inquiries. So we're a design firm. Uh, breweries reach out to us on a daily basis almost uh, to see if we're willing to work with them. And so we have a good sense uh, at a macro level what's happening in the industry. And um, we saw a shift away from breweries and planning uh, that need help with uh, their foundational branding to established breweries looking to rebrand. So this is a fun topic. We're excited you're all here and we don't have much time. We've already wasted a minute talking about sports and weather. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're gonna run through a quick introduction of ourselves and we're gonna dive into the topic. Our goal is to talk for 30 minutes. We've been given a very tight window. So we're gonna talk even faster than normal. If you have questions, uh, throw them. I see some comments rolling in already. Thank you. Throw them in the comment section. We will pause at the middle and then at the end and we will answer any and all questions you guys have. Let's keep going. Uh, who are we? Who who am I? Who knows? And why should you listen to us? Kodo is an 11 year old food and beverage branding firm. We're based in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, and Cody and I, we founded Kodo uh, right after graduating from college based on the belief that we can create better work by directly including our clients in the creative process. I will spare you the rest of the propaganda. We'll leave it at that. Since then, we've grown to be a seven person shop. We help breweries all around the world brand and these days mostly rebrand, like I mentioned. Uh, the bulk of our work over the last several years has been helping large regional breweries rebrand. So uh, a typical day for us is helping breweries uh, define their positioning, work through their brand strategy and identity and develop internationally recognized packaging, all geared towards the goal of selling more beer and increasing profit. Um, beyond beer, we also do a lot of work with hospitality groups, so like bars, restaurants, distilleries. Uh, it is not anywhere close to our beer revenue, but I think cannabis is starting to knock on the door as far as uh, cannabis work that we do, food artisans, CPG food products. If you can eat it or drink it, we brand it. Coffee, meat, cheese, beer, 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 fish, beer, 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 beer. fish mongers. Got a good fish. Uh, yeah. yeah, we've got a good fish client. Uh, what else? We've written two books on beer branding, uh, our 2017 release, the Craft Beer Branding Guide, and then our new book, uh, Craft Beer Rebranded. This is a 180 page book and a 60 page companion workbook that walks you through each step of your rebranding process. We don't want to hit you with a commercial like two minutes into this talk, but we figured if you are all here joining us uh, for a talk about brewery rebranding, you might find this interesting. Uh, today's talk is pulled directly from this, so you can check that out, buy your own copy. You can read it for free if you want to at craftbeerrebranded.com. Uh, and if you stick around to the end of the talk, if you don't leave from our rambling, uh, you may get a code for free shipping. Maybe. We have to get through this to see. Why are we here today, Cody? What are we talking about? Well, um, so when we talk about rebranding, I mean, first of all, we want to cover why uh, would you even rebrand in the first place? And there are a lot of different reasons. There are a lot of different goals and outcomes you can set to kind of measure how effective that was. Um, we're going to dive into how you do that. So we're going to talk about a concept called brand equity um, and another concept called a brand audit. We're going to kind of walk you through each one of those. Um, very useful in terms of navigating a rebrand. In fact, probably the most essential concepts that you'll struggle with. Um, the third one, and this is one that uh, comes up 
very frequently when we're talking rebrands with people, evolution versus revolution. One way to look at this is how intense is the rebrand? Are you just building like a, a subtle iterative change on what's already there? Or are you completely throwing everything out and starting over? We're going to talk about that a little bit and more. Why would a brewery rebrand? Why are we here? What are some of the common pain points and how do you benchmark goals? Let's start with negative stuff. Um, sales are flat or declining. You're self-conscious of your branding. We hear that a lot. Well, it's funny. We'll fly across the country and like two or three beers later with a client, they're like, man, I just hate wearing my t-shirt to festivals. <laughs> uh, you can have an icon issue. If you have a bombastic founder leave, uh, you can kind of, you have to reshape the story. There can be, of course, acquisitions, really annoyingly trademark disputes. We've, we've had rebrands due to that and some sort of PR disaster. These are all negative. And in our experience after doing this now for 11 years, uh, we have found that rebrands are generally or rarely, I should say, a negative thing. Uh, I think rebranding in popular culture has has maybe for for good reasons, a negative connotation. You think of like a military contractor killing a bunch of people, <laughs> yeah. like having to change your name or whatever. Yeah. Uh, for breweries, it's generally a sign that you're you're growing and you've kind of outstripped your look. Uh, a common one is, you know, your look is dated and doesn't reflect where you are today. Your core values have shifted. Your positioning has shifted. Your value proposition has shifted. Uh, you're making major changes and you want to update your branding to follow suit. So you are uh, shaping, shaping, shaking with a K up your portfolio, introducing new beers, re uh, retiring some, launching new extensions like seltzers. Have you guys heard of hard seltzer kombuchas? Quick plug. I almost forgot. We're giving a talk tomorrow at the same time, I think, on brand architecture. So if you guys are out there, I see we have a brewery from Greece in the chat. Hi, Ontario as well. Ontario, what's up? Uh, if you're launching new extensions that are outside of traditional beer, you should watch that talk and think about your brand architecture and how it impacts your overarching uh, business. Uh, and also new formats. We've had several rebrands kind of spin up from, hey, we're switching from bottles to cans. Mm -hmm. And then you start getting into that work and you go, oh, we'd like to change a bunch of other mm -hmm. stuff while we're at it. You're entering new markets, you're facing new competition. Um, those are all common reasons. Now let's talk about goals. Goal setting is very important because if you're investing in your rebrand or refresh, you need to see a return on that. Kind of, we struggle with how to frame this to, to make, to do it quickly. I think we'll just say very quickly, there are qualitative goals. Kodo is a branding firm working with breweries. When we're rebranding a brewery, uh, many of the goals tend to be fuzzy and qualitative. And there, there tends to be, especially if we're dealing with like more business minded people, uh, in this process of like, oh, those, those goals don't matter. We need to deal with quantitative goals. We think they're both extraordinarily important and we think they both have a place at the table and we use them both regularly on our projects. Uh, very quickly, uh, we're not, we don't have time to go into it today. You can read more about it at craftbeerrebranded.com. But uh, the SMART goals is how we, how we like to frame quantitative goals. So SMART, you can read it, uh, specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and time-limited. But we like to do that so that we can benchmark goals and measure them year over year. But the most important goal out of any of these goals for you guys, if you are out there considering a refresh, is that you have to drive sales. You have to increase your revenue. Top line, you have to increase profit. You have to do all these things. Uh, it's, we tend to forget because we're all having fun and drinking beer and calling it work, but, but we are running businesses. And the more, the more revenue we have, the more profit we have, the more we can invest in our team and our, our, our business. So that's the, the most important goal for any project we are ever engaged in. And we'll run through a few of these. Um, very common. These are, these are kind of peppered throughout all the projects that we handle on a yearly basis, but we want to increase brewing production by X percent. That's not something directly that branding shapes, but on the back end through depletions of sales and stuff, it does. We want to launch X new accounts, um, new markets. We want to increase Instagram followers. We actually should have had X's there as well, you know, by a very specific number, grow our newsletter. These are, these are the types of goals. We've actually just pulled these from brand strategy docs that we've handled uh, over the last few years. And then let's talk about qualitative stuff. I'm going to yeah. drink coffee. You so know. if the previous slide were, were more sort of quantitative, measurable goals, um, we also talk about kind of fuzzier qualitative stuff. So things like we want to bring consistency to all of our packaging and marketing. You can't necessarily look at packaging and say, oh, that's 74 percent consistent. But when you look at something, you know whether it's consistent or not. Um, same thing as like we want an awesome merch program we want people to post cans on Instagram. That's kind of like a binary, like you pass or fail on like, if you're getting more people sharing your stuff online, 
to things like we want to own our city. That's kind of nebulous. You can measure that with quantitative goals, but ultimately you know whether or not you're like the brewery of a city. Um, so kind of some fuzzier stuff that you can kind of zoom out and think about as you're, as you're looking at goals for rebranding. Which brings up another common concern. We were talking to a brewery just yesterday morning. Uh, and if you guys are out there watching this talk, because we invited you, email us. We, we want to kick that project off. Uh, we hear that we are worried that we will confuse our customers if we change our logo or packaging. This is this is the most common, and I understand completely. If you've used your stuff, your, your branding and packaging, even for three years, we work with breweries that have been doing it for 25 years. Uh, and so there's this common concern of how do we do that? And that brings us to brand equity. Uh, and this is basically what stays and what goes. So brand equity is a quick definition. It is the total amount of goodwill uh, we like to more focus on visual recall, but but overall goodwill, reputation, stuff like that, that your brand has with its customers. We like the metaphor, are you using a hatchet or a scalpel? Um, and so quickly, if you can look at New Belgium, Sierra and Dogfish Head, just in your mind's eye, so I don't know why I said that, if you can imagine <laughs> them updating, uh, New Belgium has recently continually doing so, Dogfish Head as well. The brand equity just is a very black and white definition is there a world in which Dogfish Head would update its brand, new packaging, stuff like that, and lose the the shark and lose that iconic typography? I would posit no. No, it, <laughs> that, that would be a failure. We all know that, uh, unless there's such, such such dramatic positioning changes or something. But um, that's kind of the stuff we're sort of we're trying to look at. So, uh, if we know what brand equity is, okay, cool. That's an easy easy concept to grasp. How do we actually define that? Uh, and, and we do that by conducting a brand audit. A brand audit. I don't know. I'm gathering my thoughts. I'm just going to read off screen. <laughs> like sound real smart. I think you're catching your breath more. Well. I am. We're talking fast <laughs> because of the time. Yeah. A brand audit is a rigorous examination of all of your communications going back to your earliest days. Um, we are doing this to determine what can be kept. Again, that answer, that question rather of, can I change my logo? Can I change my packaging? What can I change? We're trying to identify and quantitatively, as quantitatively as possible, I should say, define what can and uh, needs to be retained and what can be jettisoned. We're trying to set up parameters and guidelines. So when we're looking through this stuff, we're looking at things like your brand identity. That's a churched up way of saying your logo system, churched. going back to the beginning of time, all of your logos, packaging, tap handles, merch, digital stuff. We have, I swear I'm not just going to hit you all with commercials, but we have a, a guide, uh, a couple pages, prompts in our craft beer rebranded workbook that helps you do this stuff yourself. So you can kind of see here if you look at the the, the tiny type, mm -hmm. we're looking at do you have any uh, any specific Pantones that you've used for a long time? What are the different logo files? Uh, do you have the different versions of your tap handles? Intellectual property is a very important one that most people don't think about in this process. If you have IP, even if you kind of abandon it, quote unquote, well, I don't know that you will necessarily abandon it outright, but you need to make sure that you're considering that through this process so that you can continue policing it if you want to retain it or whatever. Um, you can check that out at craftbeerrebranded.com. And a fun exercise, again, from the Craft Beer Rebranded Workbook, um, maybe we should just say it's, we need to put, we try to make this as quantitative as possible. And it's hard to do because we're, we're saying like, without consumer studies and hundreds of thousands of dollars research project over the course of a year, we don't know if like an illustration needs to be retained on an update. So we try to bring as much context as possible. A fun way of doing that, this worked really well pre COVID, but it, you know, the world's starting to kind of open back up right as we slam into fall and winter. <laughs> um, we like to do recall exercises. So these are, these are debranded. There's nothing about rebranding or anything like that, but you print these out and you just leave them in your tap room or beer festivals get kind of touch and go because people are drunk, but uh, it's fun to have people draw your logo, your merch, your packaging for memory. And what we found, uh, this is definitely not rocket science. We're just having a bunch of drunk people draw your stuff with markers. But if someone uses a certain color or a certain icon or a certain element, no matter how rough and funny it is drawn, there's that, like if, if we've looked through stacks of like 50 of these things before, uh, that's something to consider. Like, oh, everyone identifies a yellow band at the top of our can maybe that's something we should retain. It's the closest we can get to actually getting inside people's minds and seeing how they remember your stuff. We're trying. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're actually going to pause for questions. We have a lot of stuff going on here. Do you see anything over here, Cody? Let's see. Um, Throw any questions you all have. Let's see what we got. And if nothing, we can keep rolling. I see 
Packers fan? Question mark. Yeah, I like the Packers. They're cool. Yeah, <laughs> big big fan. <laughs> um, present presentation PDF be available in a link below. I'm not sure about that actually, but shoot me an email uh, at the end if if it's not available, we'll get that to you. <clears throat> if there are no questions, then time will not be an issue because we budgeted all sorts of time for questions. Sit here awkwardly for three minutes. Let's keep going. If you all have questions, any question at all, please throw it in the comment and we will field that as we make our way through this. But don't make us beg. Please clap. <laughs> please clap. <laughs> Let's not talk about evolution versus revolution. You talk. I'm going to drink coffee. This is a brand refresh. So there's kind of, so if you're a, tackling a rebrand for your business, there's kind of two major paths you can take. One, the first one is evolution. Another way to say that a brand refresh, you're not necessarily pulling everything out roots and all and starting over. You're just updating it in kind of our folksy Midwestern language. You could call it a fresh coat of paint. I don't know how well that metaphor actually pans out, but it's good enough for this presentation. Um, now, in, in this case, a lot of your internal stuff, maybe even your staff, but definitely your core values, your goals as a company, the things that you wanted to accomplish as a company, not much has necessarily changed there. You're just kind of changing how you represent that um, out, out in the public when you're marketing yourselves. Um, I think for every one sweeping, we haven't talked about sweeping rebrands yet, but for every one major newsworthy rebrand, we're doing more subtle packaging refreshes and brand refreshes. This is like, as we mentioned at the beginning, in this space, generally, it's good news that you're you're updating and refreshing. So it's not uncommon for us to handle refreshes. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be that that is a big trend already of 2020, uh, just packaging refreshes. Truthfully, the last several years, but it's it really, yeah, yeah, it's really hitting now. Um, we do have someone from Ontario, so we're going to talk about your own local left field brewery. This was a refresh that we handled about a year and a half ago now. Um, yeah, sounds right. Located in Toronto, um, picking up steam as far as their support and, and their following, they have the kind of this fun baseball theme, um, which through the refresh, we're able to kind of explore and expand on. Um, they're like a lot of breweries, they're getting like trying to keep up with the ever evolving palette. So they're drowning in their own production schedule and they needed a way to not only have a label that stands out and looks really good, but can keep up with how quickly they need to turn over different beers. Um, and they wanted to get their merch program moving too. So some of the project goals, um, we wanted to subtly update the main mark. Um, really, they had a good bones. We just need to go in and optimize it. And we'll show you what that looks like here in a moment. Um, the big thing they wanted to is just to blow this up and, and make it so that they had other secondary stuff for merch, for things that um, they could use that's not just pl pl plastering the logo everywhere, boosting merch sales. Um, we mentioned kind of keeping up with the production schedule. So a can template that looks good, but is also easy for them to implement in-house um, and ultimately increase beer sales which should always be the goal anyway. Yeah, we left uh, specific metrics off of this, but yes, that very, very specific goal here. As Cody mentioned, uh, it, this this is where they started and really fun concept. Uh, it, it, just some, some kind of low hanging fruit stuff. They wanted to keep the mark. They wanted to update the packaging. For this project to be successful, one of the goals would be almost other than us like bragging about it and taking credit for all their hard work all the time. It should be that you you don't even know that an update here really happened. They wanted this logo to just evolve extraordinarily subtly. So this is a very clean refresh. Um, you have this like kind of grain baseball, obviously, in this type. The problem with this for you guys out there looking at that thinking there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, it it's a system typeface. That means you can just download that and who cares? But a company next door, a coffee shop, a brewery can use the same typeface. So moving to something more custom. And then the packaging on the right there, they use bifurcation and color blocking. Uh, they wanted to keep using that, but they wanted to get more information on the front and have a way to deeper tell the stories of the individual beer names and the fun baseball stories. So uh, we're gonna skip a whole lot of process here to make sure like just so miracle happens, yeah. their, their, their uh, logo is updated. But you can see this is this is uh, very, very subtle. Uh, Kodo didn't spend 8 million hours redressing or redrawing new logo concepts. We knew what it was from the get. So custom typography, beefing up that stroke so that the, the, the thing, the logo works well when you like, minimize. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff that you don't think about that makes logos and, and identities successful today. Does it work on mobile? Does it work on merch? Does it work as an avatar on social media? And then a very subtle packaging update as well. 
uh, giving that logo more room to breathe, mm -hmm. bringing in more of the style. Uh, and then an interesting parameter of this project, uh, left field, like a lot of successful breweries, ha has an in-house team, uh, a really talented designer. And so we were we were brought in to do this work and then leave. <laughs> like, thank you, Kodo. Goodbye. Um, so so the, the beer names tell baseball stories. They wanted a way to tell that story through illustrations. And so we had to create an art direct and illustration style that they could then take and repeat uh, internally, you know, very quickly. Because, again, they're launching, what, three or four beers a month. It's probably not even as much as they're doing. Yeah, it, it's 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 pretty breakneck. So, you know, they need a lot. We talked a little bit about some of those secondary icons as well. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily making things to compete with the logo, but, you know, uh, one of the coolest things about a brewery is like, can I get a cool shirt? Can I get a cool enamel pen? You know, is there some little tchotchke that I can take with me that just looks super sweet? Beyond a logo slap, can we go deeper in the story? So we help them kind of expand their visual language, give them all these great little bits of goodies so that it's not just their logo trying to do all the heavy lifting. There's lots of little storytelling elements that you can drop in different places as well. Mm -hmm. And some examples of this stuff. Just cool stuff. I mean, they've done a really good job of um, shepherding this. And, and yeah, we've become we've become very big believers in merch programs over the last couple of years because we just see we're not going to give specific numbers, but we've seen just the crazy amount of revenue you can generate from this stuff. Just and people are just leaving it on the table. If you're just doing a logo slap on your T-shirt, and we're not in the business of like doing merch programs and helping you source shirts, so we're not selling anything. But you guys out there should really think about this and think about how you can get a good a good uh, additional revenue stream with your merch. Um, <laughs> that damn tap handle. Cody uh, Cody tried to fly back from Toronto with yeah. this tap handle. It's a baseball. Yeah. Tap. So yeah, that, that has like the screw base in it. It's, it's yeah. a tap handle. Um, the TSA, as we came back through customs said, no, no, you cannot fly with this tiny baseball bat. <laughs> so Cody I, guess, I guess they were worried about me clubbing a stewardess or something. Hijacking a tiny plane. You never want that to happen. Uh, yeah. And then I think this packaging we did Greenwood, but a lot of this fun. A lot of the stuff we're getting ready to show, I think they've done themselves internally, just to show you, yeah, like these are beautiful. This is beautiful stuff. We didn't do any of this. Yeah. This is them taking the the work and running, which again, as a parameter of the project, a goal, I think marks it as being successful. We talked a little bit about this, maybe again, just as a plug for tomorrow's talk with brand architecture, mm -hmm. but left field, they, they put out this kind of endorsed brand. You'll know what that means tomorrow at 1130 AM Eastern, <laughs> uh, ice cold beer. This is, this is cool. It's 100% Ontario ale, which means I, is it a, is it a hundred miles from yeah, Ontario yep. or from Toronto? Mm -hmm. Um, that's hard to do. Like we, we have people, whenever people kind of do it locally, well, you should tell them what they did. You get ahead of yourself. So yeah, they source the green hops, everything Bad. Ontario. Yeah. Yeah. The, so there you go. the yeast, I'm sure. Uh, so we got to make this like super fun, iconic stuff. And this little dog, which I have tattooed somewhere. Tremendous. In my body. And then some numbers, we're, we're leaving out specific dollar amounts, but 24% uh, increase year over year on uh, rev and also sales volume. And again, what we did, again, we didn't say earlier because I forgot but we like to see a, a solid double digit growth year over year trajectory two or three years out. I mean, when we when we look at a rebrand and we're, we're trying to measure whether or not it was successful with our clients, uh, there's this euphoric bump that happens six to eight months later if the work's good because you're new and shiny. But uh, that doesn't really matter if it's not sustained. We're looking a year out from the stuff being in the market. We're looking two years out. We're looking three years out to see if we need to shift or change anything. So. Uh, left field, we only have one year year over year metrics, and then COVID came in, which is terrific. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, but successful know, package stuff isn't necessarily going to get hurt, but yeah. Let's move on and talk about um, some snapshots, other quick examples of evolution. Yeah, we gave you we gave you a full run through in the process, and just some some quick looks here. This is Kettle House, uh, really lovely people out in, in uh, Montana. The number one selling craft beer style in Montana is a Scotch ale, which still blows me away to this day. What? They, <laughs> it's good though. I <laughs> love I love stories like this because they have done all their work in house and they've grown to be an enormously successful brand without paying asshole designers like us to do their <laughs> stuff. And I, I love that because it's just like the early day. If you think about the early days when we were drinking Dogfish Head, like in love with it because it's just compelling and cool. Um, you, you should pay designers your stuff, but. It's cool to see this stuff happening. So they were still growing wildly and they wanted to just update their stuff. Their Kettle House is a perfect example of a company doing everything right. The beer's good, the story's good, everything's good. But you can see how, from that previous packaging how we made kind of a decision to yeah. optimize and update 
kind of contemporize a little bit this logo without ditching the things that make this logo what it is. So you have, you have that kind of badge, that yellow K, that house. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to optimize it from a graphic standpoint and from a storytelling standpoint. So we're skipping a whole like eight month process. Remember, this here, is a snapshot. Yeah. You're not gonna <laughs> very quick snapshot. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, just update the packaging. Uh, you can see I should have put these side by side, but I'm an idiot. Uh, look at the Scotch Ale there on the left, the cold smoke, uh, very clean update. I mean, obviously a very, very cleaned up hierarchy illustration style is now consistent across all of these. They have a clear uh, visual vocabulary for what colors define what skew, but not as subtle as left field, but really just a clean update. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, they'd been around a lot longer yeah. than left field too. They needed, they yep. needed the facelift more than anything. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Some other photos. I think I, I don't remember how many slides here. We'll just like cycle through till we get yeah. to the end. That cooler times pack. That is so cool. Yeah, you throw <laughs> that in your your canoe and you go catch some trout and live in beautiful Montana and not Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, Tinker Coffee. This is a, a, an, a uh, someone asked a question earlier that I saw about uh, about non alcoholic stuff. We do loads of it. We'll talk about that here in a bit. But uh, yeah, t so Tinker Coffee Company here in Indianapolis growing at a very quick clip, got a fun C and D. If you remember about the, uh, the, the reasons for people that, that might want to refresh trademark stuff, stupid stuff. So they had to update and we very subtly took their identity and created new packaging. This is an ongoing project. So we only have a few photos of mm -hmm. it, but, uh, the, the, the biggest touch point here would certainly be their packaging and we're doing their website. Stuff's in my mug stuff. right now. It is. <laughs> I've, been, I've been thinking about like a non, uh, won't interrupt the presentation by filling here. Can you just do that? Please? Yeah, absolutely. Man. <laughs> Pot of coffee here that we're trying to do. Here um, you go, Han. Thank you, sweetie. You're welcome, dear. So build out their identity. Uh, what we didn't say was that their identity, we didn't change the logo. Their logo was already in place. Thank you, sir. Uh, maybe. Precarious. <laughs> so quick update. Mm, other stuff. All right, let's talk about revolution. So uh, we saw very, very subtle updates uh, and then going up the scale to not as subtle, but still uh, refreshes. Let's talk about full rebrands. Full rebrand um, is a, a sh dramatic shift in messaging. It's a shift in what you do. It can be a shift in the role you play in your community, the beer you, you brew, the reason you exist. It can be a new leadership team. Uh, it can be changes in the landscape, the market landscape. Um, and, and, and through that, obviously, the identity needs to shift to tell that new story. Uh, we're going to we're going to tell a dramatic story here. Uh, be dramatic because of the name change. Most of our rebrands don't include a name change. If you need to change your name, except for Atlanta, which had a good case for it, there's something there's like something really wrong. Usually, you use like a trademark thing or something. Mm -hmm. So Atlanta Brewing Company, uh, for formerly Atlanta, then Red Brick Brewing. Uh, they, they were turning to this, this year. This work is now a couple years old. They were turning 25 in 2018. And for the year leading up to that, they had changed their name from Atlanta Brewing, if you can believe it, to Red Brick in 2010. Not the team that we worked with, but the previous administration losing market share. It was a it was a mid market brewery that that like a lot of folks out there, you kind of you're at it for 10, 15 years and you're kind of growing, you're kind of not, you just kind of lose your path because you don't have that fire that you have when you start out. And clear Four new and, cool, sexy breweries are opening around yeah. the corner. Like it's tough. It's really tough. And that's a tough market too, because a lot of hitter breweries have opened up. Yep. Uh, so some of their pain points, just to give you some context and why they, they consider this tired, that's their word, not ours, uh, legacy brand and reputation. Uh, they were getting lost in a sea of high energy startups. Uh, they're Branding and packaging, as you'll see here in a minute, that, that they had before uh, they they enlisted us, was not really cohesive. Their name change was misguided, to say the least. Uh, they changed to their number one selling beer name in 2010. It'd be like New Belgium changing their name to Fat Tire Brewing yeah. Company or something like that. It mm -hmm. was kind of a weird choice. While having like literally a trademark to their city, which is ex like almost impossible to do. Um, so this is their stuff that they had. Red Brick Brewing. And the packaging, uh, and so we came in. We're gonna we're gonna kind of dive into the the strategy a little bit here. We we went down there for a couple of days, hung out with their team, interviewed everyone, talked to distributors, talked to local bottle shops. We get to know as much as we can about them and their team and their culture and what opportunities we have. Um, we'll actually show we're not gonna stay on this very long because we don't want you to read it all. But this is some of the brand strategy docs that we get into. 
Uh, we're looking at positioning, key messaging. What are some pain points? What are some opportunities for growth? How can we position this both messaging wise and visually? What is the story? What is the battle flag that we're looking for here? We show that. Um, and then again, we're now taking like three month leaps into the future. Uh, this is this is the inertial, inertial? Initial. <laughs> Initial is the word. This is the first branding or the branding presentation when we started getting into the identity. So we're looking at, uh, I don't, we don't have time to present this. Uh, we share two different directions. One was a callback to their, their uh, like the bottom one there with that, that cool A, that was a, a callback to their initial Atlanta Brewing logo. And then we had something that was a little more, it, it blended a lot of things that that script, uh, spoiler alert, they ended up going with that. It blended like kind of Coca-Cola, airlines, sports, a lot of this fun stuff that's happening down in Atlanta that makes a little Atlanta bit of history. a cool market. Yeah. Yep. So we'll fast forward here. So the mark, uh, so the, I guess we're talking about rebranding now. So just to bring it back to the, the the focus of this point in the presentation, change your name. I mean, that that's sweeping. And, and through that, you need to change your identity as well. And so creating a secondary icon, that uh, that ATL, that Atlanta thing, we kind of like in a back way did their, their I, I feel like we did their uh, CVB uh, a solid by get branding the city for them. <laughs> um, and then very, very elegant, simple, packaging. Uh, this logo has so much personality that the packaging just kind of needed to highlight it and, and like no room for illustrations uh, and then have some, you know, color to differentiate the SKUs. Now we have um, like Kettle House, probably 20 images here uh, of the stuff. You kind of see how this gets applied across different touch points, packaging, tap handles, merch, all kinds of goodies. Mm -hmm. talking, but just look at the pretty stuff. Design their website uh, as well. You can check that out at atlantabrewing.com. And I think we have the brand launch in here. Yeah, we, we wanted to touch on this briefly. Uh, this is a whole other topic, so we don't have time to really dive into it. But if you are rebranding, especially if you're rebranding, but if you're refreshing as well, you should consider it. It's very important to control the narrative and tell your fans what's happening. And you can use it not as an opportunity to like do damage control, but it's an opportunity to kind of get people excited about it and let them know that a change is coming, prep the market so they understand. Like if I go in there to buy a six pack of Hop Lana and that changes, I'm not going to go, what, what is going on? Where did that beer go? You're just so, teasing it and letting people be a part of this transition yeah. as much as you can. So we did cool stuff like here's a can mock-up without the new branding on it. Here's a little peek at like pieces of art elements or kind of reviewing things in the past that we were proud of. Yep, exactly. It's a, it's a big opportunity that, I think gets bungled more often than not. We're starting, we're at a point where we are probably just gonna start making it mandatory if people are rebranding that they, they do it, whether they pay us to do it or not, like you have to do this. You can do this internally too. Yeah. If you have a good social media person, they can knock this out. Absolutely. Uh, and then just some before and after, just to kind of see where we have come from. Uh, and some numbers here, 26%, 26.6, that 0.6 matters, uh, <laughs> increase in cores year over year, 113%. Uh, increase in merch, one new market. I think they launched another market afterwards. Those are good, solid numbers that we like. Um, and again, we're looking one year, two years, three years for success, not that that like really fun six month mark. We're gonna zip through a couple more snapshots and we have 10 minutes left for, actually we'll just do this extremely quickly and we'll mm -hmm. answer questions. Southern Brewing, uh, fun brewery down in Athens, Georgia, party brewery down, down in uh, UGA. Uh, they had this really, uh, really like, frankly, boring when you when you go down there and visit their brewery and see the fun beer and the fun style. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So like, we, we kind of helped them capture some of the cool stuff we saw around town in Athens. There's a really cool music scene down there. Of course, there's all the college sports and all that kind of stuff too. Um, really creative branding that they actually have wrestling events there monthly, which blew our minds. So we got they to call it live Southern violence, which is my favorite thing that I, yeah, has ever like, done. Like, holy cow. I mean, and they have like a five acre kind of ground. So they do a lot of outdoor events, concerts, things like that. Um, we kind of give them ways to promote that some new packaging. Um, you'll notice kind of the, the modular approach to the branding. Like we're definitely taking cues from like all over Athens. There's like stuff painted on brick that's been there for a hundred years. So we're definitely pulling that into the process here. Um, fun names like 7am beer. <laughs> 7am. What's up? Yeah. 
uh, Three Rivers Distilling. Uh, I wanted to sip through this to get to questions. So yep. we rebranded Distillery. They make fantastic liquor. It's all behind us. Fort Wayne, Chicago, Indiana. Tennessee. Holler, holler. We made a glow in the dark label. That was super cool. <laughs> Hand sanitizer for the COVID conscious sign of the times. Be coffee. I, yeah, I'm actually, I'm just going to just cook through this stuff. Be coffee, another coffee roaster. Prost. Let's talk about Prost real quickly. Yep. Uh, sweeping rebrand as well. Prost Brewing changed the way that you and I drink. Uh, we were all IPA, like most beer guys, I guess, for 10 years. And then we had their pills and their beautiful, like their portfolio of lagers, and it changed everything. Uh, we don't have time to talk about this, but we 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 really got granular with defining their uh, brand strategy, new identity, telling this fun German story, but balancing that with not being old world and kitsch, but being contemporary to live in a very very bougie part of Denver. You'll notice uh, part of the spec here behind me. <laughs> packaging that little barrel, which I'm super cool freaking thing. And website packaging, and then uh, some heavy hitting numbers here. good numbers uh, but particularly those merch numbers were eye popping we put this yeah. branding on like they did all kinds of cool sweatshirts and and tote hats and scarves and glassware and they have just been killing it from a merch standpoint yeah 92 percent increase in cans 60 percent bottles 400 percent merch which if my math is right that's five times i don't I always get confused on that two new states i think there are actually more states coming online as we speak even through covid they're growing steadily through covid and then tap room revenue jumped as well uh, wrapping up very quickly. If you like this stuff, go to our YouTube channel. Uh, we haven't really done too much with that historically, but we're starting to put out more content about rebranding. So you can check that out. You can check this book out at craftbeerrebranded.com, like we mentioned. And if you want to use a code for free shipping uh, on in the continental United States, sorry, folks that are outside of here, but you can use CBP book is the code. It's uh, craftbeerrebranded.com. You can buy it. We will now hopefully not awkwardly look through these comments and find some <laughs> questions. Please throw any questions you have. We have uh, eight or nine minutes here, it looks like, to come here. Do you have any experience with non-alcoholic drinks? Yes, loads. Uh, a lot of a lot of seltzers, a lot of kombuchas, but a lot of that stuff is in progress as we speak, lots of coffees as well. Did a really interesting low THC cannabis drink as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess that's technically non alcoholic. It's no, still, no. Still, still gets you, still get gets you where it needs to go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what are some of the most out there reasons why someone wanted to rebrand? I think a, a reason, it's not necessarily out there, but we've had people come to us that want to change just because they feel like they're kind of bored with their look. And that, that always struck me as a weird reason for wanting to invest, you know, 50 grand into a project. It's like you're just kind of bored with it. Uh, generally, there should be a pain point driving it, I think. Uh, thank you, Justin. What if a customer draws almost exactly his label when asking to draw the label? Uh, you stick with the old one in more aspects or you totally still totally redesign it? So that that would be evidence of strong brand equity. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you keep your labels exactly the same. You might have other nagging issues that the recall exercise doesn't capture. Um, however, that's a strong argument for um, keeping whatever those elements were and maybe trying to optimize them, make them, making them easier to see in, a, in an aisle, giving a graphic designer, you know, some hours with it to really optimize it. And it's a question of context too. If you have one guy or gal uh, draw the thing and then you have 50 others that don't, I mean, again, this is, it's kind of a common sense thing. We're seeing what mm -hmm. sometimes breweries come to us knowing that they want to keep everything as is. We were talking about that just yesterday as yeah. well. Uh, the brewery that we're talking to said, um, if we come to you and tell you exactly what we want, like, are you going to listen to that? Or are you going to poke holes in it? And, and the answer is yes to both of those. Like we, we will listen, you know, your brewery better than we do, or talk about Kodo better than whoever you hire to do your work. You know, your business better than they do, but they should come in, uh, in with a set of agnostic outside eyes and, and, and kind of size you up and, and see what opportunities are in your market. Carrie asks, thank you for that question, Rick. Uh, what about zagging when the market is zigging? In other words, in Ontario, everyone's going to 16 ounce cans. Would it make any sense to move into something like 12 ounce bottles? I think there's a reason why uh, markets shift the way they do. And a lot of that's driven by uh, consumers, obviously, but distributors and, and, and how how just people are buying beer at the time. 16 ounce cans are big because you can do like the four pack drop of a 10 barrel batch or something. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, it's as binary as everyone's doing X, we should do Y in the beer space. If you look at non-alc space, 
uh, like if you think about like famous, famous examples, uh, there's there's uh, Cokes. So we're going to make Red Bull, this tiny little can. Mm -hmm. And then Monster Energy comes out with this like fire Massive extinguisher size thing. thing. These are really stupid examples, but that's how consumers uh, live in that like kind of broader CPG space. For beer, I wouldn't just go, oh, we're going to do 12 ounce bottles because everyone's doing cans. Uh, yeah, that, like that you, need, you need a compelling reason outside of just we're doing it just to be different because frankly, like cans are, you know, people can take cans to events or outside. Like there's a reason cans are the thing right now. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Bob asks, what about creating new branding that holds up over time so we don't have to rebrand? That's a core thing that we we flirted with writing a book about this, but it, I think it's just an article rather than a book. Uh, when you create your branding, it, it like Prost is a good example. Maybe we'll, I won't go back. I'll just talk about it. When we create branding, our yeah, there <laughs> we like to create a core identity and most importantly, the story and positioning that will last through updates. I think that overall, if you think about five years, 10 years, two years at this point, trends change so fast that you should update some of the, the broader trappings of your brand. You know, your packaging should be refreshed because uh, the, the market is calling for a new hierarchy or new X or Y or Z. Do people want to know about a beer style or about a fanciful beer name or an illustration? But your core brand should hold through. It may even need to be updated subtly, but I think if done correctly, we're creating something timeless. It's a, a hard thing to pin down. A really, I think, clean cut and example that everybody's seen and everybody would understand is the um, the when Miller Lite switched back to those kind of retro style white cans. Yep. Now they yeah. didn't literally take the art of the old cans and run them. They caught the essence of that and then updated it for modern times. So if you look at the actual old Miller Lite cans and the the kind of like ones where they like redressed it in the in the last five ten years and their sales exploded because of it. Yeah. Um, you can kind of see how, yeah, it's the same design, but it's not. I mean, it's been tweaked for now. Uh, Justin asked, do you find a lot of times clients, when they come to you, they want to do just a logo to start off, or do you usually talk them into package deals, can, can logo, artwork, merch, et cetera? Kodo is not a good fit just for, so yes, we do see that. Um, for a firm of our size, we're not a good fit just for logos. So we, we generally would kind of refer them to folks. Um, but yeah, if you're going to invest in this, uh, I, I think that it should be, I mean, that's a stupid thing to say without knowing the context of this specific project, but generally you want to do your all, like all your touch points, your core identity, your packaging, your website, everything. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, we still have people like say, Hey, can you design a 12 ounce can for us? We turn all of that work down because mm -hmm. of it doesn't make sense for us to do, but yes, uh, Justin as a brother in arms, a uh, graphic designer, <laughs> yes, we do see that. Yeah. Let's see. What is the best point of sales material a small craft brewery can use to make as much noise in the beer market? Uh, I would say, uh, believe it or not, your website. I, th I think is yeah. Uh, is no, absolutely. Important. Does your website? Can I? Is it? If I'm um, looking for a place to go to pick up a growler or to pick up a six pack or whatever on my phone, can I figure out your hours quickly on on your website? For example, like that. That's way more important than people think. Um, a lot of people go, well, can I just have Facebook? And it's like, well, maybe, but if I can't find this stuff quickly, I'm not going to give you a chance. Mm -hmm. As a brewery and an asshole designer, I feel that. Thank you, Kaylee. <laughs> Cooler Times Pack is awesome. Yes, it is, Justin. Thank you. <laughs> a couple more questions. We have maybe three or four more minutes here. I think we have a hard stop. We're going to get kicked off by Andrew. So please throw any other questions you guys have. I uh, love those Atlanta cans. My barometer is usually, can I recognize them on a shelf? That is exactly what we go for too. When we are, when we're mocking up packaging, uh, we actually have shelves, kind of a fake off premise set behind us. We like to look at it in context with the competitive set and looking at it from an angle and a weird angle and shitty light. Like we need to make sure that you can read the thing. If it's shoved in a cooler or like you have a, a, a guy in a, a beer shop, you kind of shove your beautifully designed six pack in there, like with the end cap. They don't care. They never care. And they shouldn't care. <laughs> it's our job as designers and your job as breweries to make sure that your packaging screams your branding, uh, no matter where it is shown. Do you guys choose your own photography or use mock-ups? If so, who you get your mock-ups from? Uh, we do a lot of our, we do our own photography. We also are big fans of Outshinery, free commercial for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they do lovely mock-ups uh, and you, if you guys are out there are breweries and you want to make consistent packaging on your website, you should check out Outshinery. Uh, beautiful stuff. Are you also up to review some rebrands, designs from other designers like me? No. <laughs> <laughs> Email me, uh, Rick. I think my yeah my email email address is on there. I'll make fun of your work. 
Uh, any suggestions for your competitors? Oh, for uh, Kodos competitors? Uh, man, uh, I mean, this is like advice for any business, but I am stunned at how many breweries, how many design firms, how many in plumbers, any anyone do not consider positioning. You need to understand what you do, how you're not necessarily better, but how you're different from people and who your who your customers who are. For. Yeah. If you do like if, if breweries just literally do that, you can create a really stellar business. Uh, so competitors uh, for Kodo, you need to understand your positioning. Kodo has grown up to be a seven person firm. We handle typically in the 30 to $100,000 range projects. There's a whole lot of room underneath that. And then there are a lot of people way above us that are much bigger than us. They get you know, bigger projects than us. So there's plenty of room in the market for all sorts of stuff. Uh, Graphic Village, hi, I know you guys. Are you beverage specific or would you work with a CBD company? We are working with a CBD company as I say this. So yeah, we, we do food and beverage. Uh, cheers y'all, Isaac, good to see your face again. Hope to catch up soon. Thank you, Facebook user. I don't know who you are because your name didn't come through. Uh, what do you guys try to use as a standard lead time for a label design gig? It depends if we're like we're, we're constantly doing new work for existing clients. Some of that stuff can be turned around in a week. Uh, if we're coming in off the just from the ground floor to design something are we on time, we have a couple more minutes. Mm. Uh, a typical project for us might range like three months uh, that generally includes branding and some packaging. I need more context to answer that question properly. So Facebook user, <laughs> again, I can't see your name. Uh, email me and I can answer that question more. Kaylee. With a super saturated market, how do you avoid accidental copycat design? I've seen so many breweries lately putting out can release. It ends up on the you know, uh, worst beer blog for sure because it's a knockoff. Uh, often artists claim it's total coincidence. How do you sift through the thousands of labels and brand? We were talking to a lawyer about this. Yeah, we were talking to an intellectual property lawyer about this yesterday, and she pretty much agreed with us that there's really no new ideas under the sun. So you're going to step on toes at this time. Yep. Some people do it on purpose too, and you can kind of tell the difference. Um, we focus <laughs> on the very local competitive set. Uh, we think that's the most important thing to do when you're designing something for someone like in a city, for instance, we, we do our best. It's it, there are millions of designers. They yeah. all have the same software we do. It's hard. You yeah. Know? And I won't complain too much. Like if, if there's one thing I could change about the design industry, it would be, it would be the, the critique style yeah. of X looks like Y therefore you are a rip off. It's like, no, it's just like bifurcation. The Atlanta cans, for instance, beautiful cans i i will stand up them against any anyone else but that's an extremely common style uh it's it's called bifurcation we've written about it for years now on our branding trends pieces so it's very hard uh kaylee to give you something actually actionable we look at the competitive set whether we gather them uh, as jpegs to use in a pdf or we gather actual uh packaging to uh sit the the proposed concepts up against on a shelf Couple more questions, and I think we are out of time. Uh, Tyler, with the realm of hype beer brewery where labels don't have a dedicated template, how would you suggest going about showing an identity in that brand context, i.e., Evil Twin, other half? That's a great question. Uh, in that context, I think the actual like Modern Times is doing it now as mm -hmm. well. Uh, hype breweries, the the style of the packaging itself, in a weird way, becomes the identity. You don't have a fancy label like your bad or label logo in one spot on the can. It's just you know what that style is and you go to grab that style and, and it, it works uh, for now. Uh, I think I will see where how that how that does here over the next five years, uh, because I think the market's definitely saturated uh, on, on that, that front. Uh, good question, Tyler, especially in a world where everyone needs it right now. There's yeah, I mean, Kaylee, yeah, that's how it is. Yeah. <laughs> you do have to kind of be hard headed about it and, and like, you know, respect other people's work and don't rip people off. But, you know, for God's sake, too, there's All right. it's a numbers game. We've been given five minutes over, which we are now at. If you have any other questions at all that we didn't get to, uh, I think we got all the questions here, but feel free to, to email us, uh, Isaac at cododesign.com and use that code if you want the book. We, we've given you like 25 calls to action here, which is bad design <laughs> on my part. But, but you, you can find us out there. Hit us up on Instagram and all that stuff. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I think we're going to close the window. So uh, have a great day and check us out tomorrow at 1130 a.m. Eastern for our talk on brand architecture as well. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yep. Cheers.